Are you afraid of the dark? There are some places where you don't want to be in. Deep inside the mines is already scary, but it's the stories behind it that make my skin crawl. The Ringwood Mine in New Jersey might sound like a typical mine for some people, but for others, it's a place that no one wants to go. It was once a thriving mine with one of the largest iron productions in the world. More than 100 years ago in the early 1900s, people abandoned the mine and it's still open for curious tourists to take a peek. During its heyday, thousands of workers would get up every day and prepare themselves to work in very dangerous conditions. The mine was prone to cave-ins and various accidents that happened regularly. People were getting underpaid even though they knew how dangerous it was to be there. Think less than a single dollar per day to get dirty and without sunlight for most of your day. But that's not the reason why people nowadays avoid it. It's because there were reports of paranormal activity down there. Some of the locals claim they heard footsteps and voices originating from inside the mines years before it was abandoned. Some people saw figures walking around their homes while holding lanterns in their hands, something which was very common back in those days. Although people have claimed to hear these strange noises, there's no evidence to suggest that it was anything paranormal. Back in those days, between the 1800s and the early 1900s, there weren't any proper treatments or precautions for safety and health. People needed to work, and this was a quick way of earning money. No one ever thought about being down a mining shaft was scary or not. Imagine you're one of those workers who are about to finish your shift when the lantern above you starts to die out. You get some matches and try to ignite them, but no luck. After a while, you realize that it's just you down there and everyone else has left. You pack up your gear and make your way out following the string of lights that were placed strategically so that no one gets lost down there. As you make your way through the narrow path, you start hearing voices coming from behind the walls. At first, you don't think much of it considering the reverberation of sounds within the mines. But then, you listen closely and realize that these sounds seem like they're literally coming from within the walls that are too thick to be heard from outside. You glue your ear to the walls and hear someone call your name. You jolt and run towards the mouth of the cave. However, the lights are flickering and the voices are getting louder and louder. The voices are jumbling together, creating an incoherent mix of weird gibberish and what appears to sound like someone chanting your name. Your heart is racing and you're sweating profusely. You don't really know where you're going since everything looks the same. Suddenly, you hear the sound of rumbling coming from the belly of the mine and then silence. Everything is black. That's what it would feel like if you were a miner during those days. Back to the creepy stories. In West Riding, England, the name Oaks Pit strikes fear into the local community. The people of Barnsley remember that the mining site was one of the mining disasters in British history on December 12, 1866. The gases inside the mines ignited a fire causing a major explosion. The fire spread and raged on for many days, destroying the mining equipment and wooden supports that were built. Finally, around 100 tons of coal collapsed into a crater at the mouth of the shaft, sealing it for good. However, very recently, people began to notice something strange. Quite recently, a team specialized in otherworldly phenomena decided to investigate the site to try and figure out what happened there. They got around to see if there was anything left that they could communicate with. In the end, the team concluded that this place was indeed freaky. There wasn't enough evidence to prove that the place was haunted. During the early 1900s, there was a silver rush in Alaska in the western part of the Wrangell Mountains. The Tonopa Mining District, which is now a museum, was part of a park that hosted plenty of buildings such as a blacksmith shop and a hospital, among others. While there isn't any particular story like the previous ones, this mine is known to be haunted. There are plenty of theories behind it. Some say it's ancient spirits occupying the mines, while others say it's from the prospectors who used to work there. Either way, you can easily get a guided tour in and around the area, even at night if you're brave enough to go. 
Mining has always been a part of human history. The first metals to have ever been mined were gold and copper. Some scientists have found evidence of copper pipes to be more than 5,000 years old. Copper was necessary for the next stage of human advancement, as it helped us with technology for defending ourselves and trading. Ever heard of the term luck of the Irish? That's actually a mining term during the gold and silver rushes in Western America, when most of the luck was going to the Irish miners who were finding everything. In 1863, the vulture mine in Arizona was thriving with gold, as if the name of the mine wasn't creepy enough. Up until 1946, it was producing millions of ores of gold, but in between, the mine closed for certain times. Many investigators decided to look around the mine to see if there was anything strange happening inside. According to them, they heard some noise coming from above when they were inside. The locals of the area later chased them out since they were trespassing. The Atlas coal mine opened and closed quickly between 1936 and 1979 in Alberta, Canada. The coal was mined to produce electricity and heating. The mine was known for having two shafts, both of which were connected by a tunnel at its base. The owners of the mines decided to build houses for their workers and their families, since they knew they were creating many jobs. They eventually built a school, a hospital, and a library. But in 1979, the mine closed due to an accident. And ever since then, the mining town was abandoned. Many people have reported seeing some lights inside the buildings, despite them being empty, as well as hearing weird noises from within the walls. Some remarkable things were discovered in mines, including the mighty Titan Boa. This giant serpent was slithering around roughly 58 million years ago and was more than 40 feet in length and weighed as much as a black rhino today. The coal miners in Colombia were digging out some coal when they discovered the fossil of this giant snake. Initially, they thought it was an anaconda, but it was much bigger than that. Imagine making that discovery. Now, imagine roaming through a mine and discovering antique European cars dating back to the 1930s. In 2016, a Belgian teacher was going through a French mine when he discovered the tunnels which led to the cars. It's believed that they were kept there as a secret stash, but no one claimed them back. Even though they're all rusty, their value certainly didn't drop. If you ever wanted to visit the world's largest freshwater dive resort, then we have the Bon Terre in a lead mine in Missouri to thank for that. It was a fully functioning mine up until 1962 when it shut down. The company that was operating it pulled the plug, including the water pumps. Slowly but surely, water began to rise and fill the mine, and by the 1970s, the three lowest levels were completely submerged. It then became known as the world's largest underground freshwater lake, and was named the Billion Gallon Lake. Most of the mining equipment is still underwater and there are dozens of miles to discover. Count me in. So in the early 2000s, a geology major went on a field trip to the world's largest open pit coal mine in Colombia. He picked up a piece of rock and noticed impressions of some prehistoric leaves on it. Then he found more rocks and each of them had the same pattern. Back then, the student could hardly know that his discovery would help describe the largest snake that has ever lived on Earth. The student took his findings to a local scientist who called up the Smithsonian Institute and invited them for a fossil hunt. He wasn't that surprised, as he knew there were fossils in the pits of Serihan. Back in 1990, another geologist found a fossil there and brought it to his office. He wasn't sure of what it was and called it a petrified branch. Years later, a paleontologist saw an image of this branch. He knew it wasn't a branch at all, but a fossilized jawbone of an animal. The scientist got so excited about the find that he flew all the way to Colombia. He wanted to examine the fossil, but no one had the key to its glass display case. The scientists couldn't wait, so they broke the glass and confirmed that it was a fossil of an animal that lived millions of years ago. After Herrera's finding, they knew exactly there were more fossils in the area. 
It took the team of scientists about two years to figure out they were all a part of a giant snake and not a crocodile, as they thought because of the size. They managed to establish it by looking at the vertebrae and ribs of around 30 giant snakes. Now, you might think that fossils would get easily destroyed in an open pit coal mine. But in fact, they were found under the coal that served as a protective layer for them. Sadly, the scientists couldn't find the Titanoboa skull. Unlike jaws, which are extremely powerful thanks to their muscles, snake bones are pretty fragile. That's why they usually crumble long before the sediment can appear over them. But still, the researchers managed to find three skull fragments. Thanks to this discovery, they've made a full-scale replica of the snake's head, which supported the theory that it used to be one of the largest predators of its time. If you're starting to freak out, don't worry, so am I. They also established it was related to modern boas and anacondas. That's how Titanoboa got its name. It's basically a titanic boa. The huge snake was officially described in 2009. Titanoboa was thriving around 60 million years ago, 6 million years after the Tyrannosaurus rex roamed the planet. Back then, it enjoyed the climate of the area in South America, which is now Colombia and Peru. It got almost as long as a bowling lane, 50 feet, or twice as long as the biggest snake living today. It was as heavy as four giant anacondas. It got this long and this heavy thanks to a lucky coincidence. Snakes are cold-blooded animals, so they need a warm client to live and grow in. Northeastern Colombia was perfect. It was about 90 degrees Fahrenheit when Titanoboa was alive. Titanoboa wasn't that fast, especially on land. But it most likely spent much time in or near the water. Our hero could swim at a speed of up to 12 miles per hour. Like present-day snakes, it could wriggle around and change direction really quickly. Scientists still aren't sure if it could climb trees. Paleontologists believe that Titanoboa had brownish or grayish skin. It was the perfect color for the serpent to hide in the muddy rivers of the tropical rainforests. But then again, I don't see why it would have to hide from anyone, given its size. The largest snake ever wasn't venomous, but it didn't stop it from hunting any animal it wanted. And although it could choose pretty much anything, its favorite meal was most likely fish. Scientists decided so based on the snake's palate and the number and type of its teeth. You can't recreate the giant's diet today, as all of those fish types are also extinct. When it wanted to spice up its menu, Titanoboa dined on other reptiles. It sneaked up on its prey and got them down with one quick strike. Its bite had a very special design. The structure of its jaws let Titanoboa clamp down on the body of its prey, so there was no escape. Titanoboa also had a mean set of thin and pointed teeth. They bent inwards in the snake's jaw like fishing hooks. This little feature helped Titanoboa get a grip on its prey and prevent the slightest chance of its running or swimming away. It could most likely easily swallow even large turtles and crocodiles. Now, all that sounds pretty scary, but we have nothing to worry about as titanoboas are long extinct, right? Well, technically, as the temperatures on Earth are going up, it's quite possible that snakes might also grow in size. They love heat more than anything, so they should feel comfortable here. Of course, that would be a completely different snake, but it's not impossible that we'll see something similar to titanoboa. But before you think of escaping to another planet, remember that huge snakes would need something huge to eat. Such giants prefer to wrap around something huge and swallow it. Most people would be simply too small for them. So unless the huge snake was starving, I don't think it'd waste its energy on attacking anything too little. Plus, like any other snake, Titanoboa had a sharp and delicate sense of smell needing exceptional conditions, and was sensitive to vibrations. A little too smelly, too noisy, too cold, too dry or too wet, and the snake wouldn't go near this place unless absolutely desperate. So, if you live in a big city, your chances of meeting a huge snake like Titanoboa are about zero. Rural areas are something different, but the only place where the giant serpent would consider living would be near the equator. 
We already have some pretty giant snakes in the warmest regions of the world. Amethystine python, or less poetically, scrub python, is a gentle giant. It's the largest snake in Papua New Guinea in Australia. It can grow to the enormous size of 28 feet and weigh up to 77 pounds, which is about as heavy as a Dalmatian. Scrub pythons are pretty curious, sometimes slithering inside people's homes in Australia. But they're mostly harmless to humans. Their favorite food is rodents, bats, and birds that come to streams for water. Until then, pythons quietly lie in wait. They have heat centers in the pit of their muzzles. They help the pythons better see warm-blooded animals they can have for dinner. The African rock python is one of only 11 living species of its kind. It's currently the second largest snake on the planet. This huge brown snake reaches lengths up to 20 feet and weighs about half as much as the giant panda. It's very serious about its meals as it can catch an antelope and eat it whole. Even the cold-blooded crocodiles are afraid of this beast because it can easily eat one of their kind too. In 1958, a zoologist found a 4-foot-long young Nile crocodile inside an African python's stomach. According to the scientist, the python said, Well, I don't know about you, but I find this whole thing hard to swallow. Actually, that's not true. Pythons can't talk, as far as we know. The reticulated python holds the record as the longest of all the living snakes in the world. The largest of these guys made it into the Guinness World Records in 2011 with a length of 25.2 feet. Its name is Medusa, and it lives in a zoo in Kansas City, Missouri. An adult reticulated python is large enough to swallow a human whole. Or a whole human, either way. But these snakes are mostly quite peaceful and prefer to lie down without much movement. Although many pythons have dwarf forms that are much smaller than their full-grown cousins, reticulated pythons also have super dwarf forms. You can keep one of those as an 8-foot-long pet. Yes, it's considered a dwarf form, although it's longer than the average human is tall. You know, somehow, I still don't find that comforting. When you think of theme parks, you normally imagine laughter and fun times. But once they're closed and abandoned, now that's a whole different story. Let's take a look at some of them. You decide to take a trip to New Orleans to visit Six Flags. When you arrive there, you discover the theme park is deserted. The sign that says closed for storm is still standing. You're feeling adventurous, so you let yourself pass the crackling gates. Is it chilly in here, or is it just me? Hmm. You walk past a swimming pool, and it looks like there's someone in there. You get closer, and oh no, it's an alligator! Better run and leave that thing alone. You keep exploring the site. The park took inspiration from the city's French architecture, but today the buildings are dirty, the windows are all shattered, and there are unusual items everywhere. Say, what is this vintage rollerblade doing here? The park closed during the hurricane, and it was left standing under 7 feet of water. No wonder the metal rides are all rusty now. This carousel doesn't look too inviting to me. We'll have to come back mm, another time. Hey, at least you got some cool-looking pictures, right? Let's make this next one even more exciting. Imagine you plan to visit Data Park at night. Somewhere in the countryside of Belgium, you'll find a creepy theme park derelict from many years ago. You have nothing with you but the floodlight on your phone. You see the entrance of a bridge and start to make your way across. The bridge sways and creaks. Just FYI, you are crossing one of the longest hanging bridges in Europe. You made it through. Whew. The surrounding woods are terrifying, and several deserted attractions start popping up along the way. The forest has taken this twirling swing set. This huge slide would probably break if you tried to use it now. The park is in terrible condition. No wonder they closed it down due to security reasons. Best to leave it now and come back in the daylight. Your next stop is Wonderland Eurasia, also known as Anka Park in Turkey. The theme park opened in March 2019, but closed shortly after. Once inside the gigantic complex, you stumble upon what looks like an empty warehouse, but ends up being an indoor roller coaster. 
Everything was left intact and is as good as new. You even take a quick sit on one of the roller coaster carts perfectly lined up for the next ride. If you're feeling really adventurous, you can walk on the rails of the indoor coaster. Just be careful not to fall down. Oh, over there are the Flintstones. It's almost like a childhood deja vu here in the youngsters section of the park. On the horizon, you see what looks like the Jurassic World and decide to check it out. There are neglected statues of huge T-Rexes and fake skeletons of dinosaurs lying across the floor. Unlike the other derelict parks, everything here is new, which makes it all the more strange. Nara Dreamland was meant to be Japan's Disney World, but the project failed over time. Today, it's inhabited by moist ivies and strange birds. To get in, you'll pass a drawbridge and head into a pastel-colored castle. Your heart might be faster than usual when you pass a fog-covered roller coaster. Was that meant to be the Matterhorn? Yup. Everything about this place says you shouldn't be there. Tossed on the park's floor, you'll see reels of tickets and misconfigured stuffed animals. How about walking into an empty diner? It's bizarre how the tables and stools are still in place. Strolling through what was once a gift shop, you'll see empty shelves and an old-school cash machine. I'd say you better leave before anything comes out of here. Now, if I say Joyland, what do you imagine? The name says it all, right? But if you decide to visit Joyland today, I bet you'll have a very chilling time. Down in Wichita, Kansas, you'll find a once-famous but now empty theme park filled with eerie sights. A pale blue slide in the middle of a forest? Check. Empty warehouses straight out of a horror movie? Check. A wacky shack that looks truly wacky? (laughs) You bet. But if you visit it on a good sunny day, I'd say the park is weird but still has some beauty. Joyland was built in the late 1940s. It carries a vintage aura that goes well with the neglected atmosphere. Hey, look at this rusty yellow Ferris wheel with a strip ticket box in front. I dare say it's almost charming. The Magic Harbor Amusement Park is not that magical after all. Just outside of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, you'll find an old theme park left to nature. Here, bumper cars are not bumping anymore. If you get into a hedge maze, you'll probably never find your way out of it. I'm not sure what you'll see running around amongst the rusty rides, so good luck if you're planning a visit. If you're looking for somewhere to cool down on a hot and sunny afternoon, how about Disney's River Country? Just kidding. You're definitely not going to want to get in the water there. The park was built in the 1970s and closed in 2001. Pay a visit to the Whitewater Rapids on foot instead of floating down the fake river. You'll have about 330 feet to stroll along a very bumpy pathway. Maybe you'll see hanging tires that served as swing sets out in the bay. You can even try zip lining if you trust the cable. To add a little more creepy to this story, the park was closed down due to a dangerous bacteria that thrived in warm bodies of water. Are you sure you don't fancy a swim? When you think Italy, I bet you think pasta and pizza, and a leaning tower somewhere. Well, in the south of Italy sits the empty Miragica Amusement Park. The entrance still says welcome, but people stopped coming a few years ago. The site is covered in grass everywhere. The toy-like architecture is still there. Beneath the forgotten rails of an open-air roller coaster, you can almost hear the screams of excitement of people on the ride. This part of the park is usually prohibited, but there's no one around to control that now. It might be scary to be here, but adrenaline sure is running high. This next theme park is vacant only during a certain time of the year, but it still gives the true heebie-jeebie vibes. You have to catch a train from the city and travel to the end of the line till you reach the park. Coney Island is a seasonal park, open only from the middle of spring to the middle of fall. If you want to catch its unnerving vibe, you have to visit in winter. Then, you'd walk through the rows of empty stalls with the fairy string lights still hanging above your head. 
It looks frozen in time as all the rides lay shut down. Speaking of which, sometimes it gets frozen for real. Under many inches of snow, Coney Island is a little less disturbing. Then again, snow does have that effect on landscapes. But the park is empty and deserted nonetheless. I bet it's a great photo op. Now, be sure to tell me in the comments which abandoned amusement park you found the creepiest. Hey, you know me, I won't be checking any of these out. I'll let you go first.